Welcome to another video in the Tutorial Linux Basic System Administration series. This video is the first advanced video we're going to do. This is where it starts getting cool. Our first topic for this is processes. In this video we're going to talk about the basics and the sort of process life cycle. Okay, so what is a process? It's any application really or shell command or something that the kernel spawns to get something done on the system. If something's getting done, a process is doing it on Linux. So this is your web browser, your web server, your vulnerability scanner, and even things like reading files, the commands we've talked about so far, all spawn a process that does something. A process sort of has two parts to it, uh, one of which is the address space. So that's like a, uh, some physical memory address that it gets to write stuff to. So that's your RAM in your computer. The space that a process can take up on that RAM is its address space. Now it might not see the absolute addresses. It sees like a virtual address that is given to it by the kernel. So the kernel sort of sits between a process and the hardware, but each process has some address space that it can use. And the second part of each process is those kernel data structures that are about dealing with that process. So the kernel keeps track of stuff like um, who owns the process, uh, what process spawned it, uh, because all processes come from other processes, what address space it's allowed to write to, what priority it's running at, is this like a high priority process that can sort of block other processes from running or not, uh, how much in terms of resources can it use, uh, what files and network ports is it using? What is it allowed to use? And the signal mask, which we'll talk about in the next video. So those are the two components of a process. You have some, some kernel data structures and some address space that the process can use for, its, for doing its thing. Each process has an ID. That ID is called the process ID, or PID. So if we run a command like top, if we run a command like top, we can see uh, on the left here the process IDs. And we can see the user. So this is a lot of what the kernel knows about the process. So talking about how much memory it's got, how much CP it's using, how um, what its priority is, how nice it is. We'll talk about all these things in a second. But for now, process ID. This is a unique number, which you can use to refer to each process. Now, ID1 uh, is always init. Init is ID1. That's the very first process, sort of the mother of all processes. And it's the original parent of all processes. That's called init. Matter of fact, let's see if I can. Can see it running. Its PID is one. That's PID is process ID, and here it is. So init is the first or initial process that gets run. The kernel spawns that during boot, and init does things like um, run through all the startup scripts, uh, among other things, and spawn the first processes that set up Linux when you boot. So how a process is created. Basically, uh, as soon as a process is created, it gets the next available process ID. Process IDs are unique. Like you saw, there's only one init process, and the init always has process ID one. Now, there's an exception to this in like a system that's using virtualization, like container-based virtualization, for example, uh, like Linux KVM, which we'll talk about later. It's, you can set up virtual machines that think they are a real Linux install, even though they're actually just sort of relegated to some directory or jail on your file system. So this is like a safe way or safer way of running web services. So that if someone hacks in and like breaks into your web server and gets access on that machine, they only have access to an isolated environment and they can't actually take over the real machine that it's running on. So for things like this, um, you actually can have two init processes. You, you would have one on 
the host machine, so the real machine, and then one on the virtual machine that thinks it is the only init process with ID1 running. But so that's containerized, and that's sort of an exception to this rule. The other thing in terms of process IDs that is important is uh, the parent process IDs. Each process is spawned by some parent, and it's useful to know, it, for example, if a process is misbehaving, what parent process started it. If that parent dies or has died by the time you get to looking at that process, all processes without parents are re like reparented to init. So init is sort of the, the mommy for all the processes whose parents have died. Is this sounding weird yet? It's kind of funny that they designed it to use this language, but but it makes sense. And this way, it's something very technical that's actually intuitive to us because we're just talking about parents and children, right? UID and effective UID. So the UID of a process is basically which user owns this process. And you can see here, for example, Dave owns process 1586, which is the VBox client process, which is something that has to do with the fact that I'm running this as a virtualized operating system in VirtualBox. Um, so the kernel is also keeping track of what user owns the process, and that's the UID and the EUID, effective user ID, is basically, uh, you can think of it as a process is spawned by a user, but doesn't necessarily need the permissions of that user. So for example, if root spawns a process, you don't want that process to be able to do anything on the file system, because, you know, God forbid it, you know, makes a mistake or less likely, you know, does something malicious. So effective user ID is a way of giving that process permissions that are different from the user that actually spawned it. Um, there's also, uh, you have users and groups. There's also the group ID and the eGID the effective group ID of a process, but those those aren't really things that you're going to be looking at a lot. They're really only useful when it when it comes to looking at file creation of a process. So when a process creates a new file based on some rules, that file will have the permissions of the effective group ID of the process. But you don't really need to worry about that. It, you will very rarely need that in real life. Now the next the next uh, thing here is niceness how nice is this process being to others? Effectively, does this process hog resources? Have you allowed it to hog resources? So it's basically when you set out to run a process, you can say, hey, I'm planning on being really nice to other users. This is low priority. The higher the niceness number is, the nicer the process is planning on being. So if you have a really low priority task, you set the niceness high. That is, make it lower priority. But we'll talk about that later. But that gives you sort of an overview of all the components of a process. You have some ID, some parent ID, because all processes come from other processes. Then you have some kind of scheduling priority, niceness, and basically that the kernel is keeping track of all these statistics that a process has. So basically the life cycle is all processes, except for init, are created by some other process first. So that parent process decides it needs to spawn some other program or a process, so it forks or clones itself. After that fork, you have two identical processes, right? Because the parent process is basically the exact same thing as what it's created, because it's literally a clone, um, except that the cloning, like the forking operation, gives different return values to the child and the parent, but you don't need to worry about that. So that's how they keep track of which is which. And then that child usually will start some other program, um, which is the whole purpose of forking. And uh, it'll probably call something exec related and execute a new program or process. Um, but how does init get started? It's sort of a mystery of life. Well, the kernel starts it during boot. Um, init is the first process, the initial process or initializing process. I'm not sure where that comes from. Um, on boot, the kernel starts it with a process ID of one. And then it goes through and runs all the startup scripts. Um, those are like your RC files. Uh, well, it depends. I mean, different Unix and Linux versions have different init systems. You've got like BSD init, which is great. You've got Sys5 init, 
We've got uh, like an Ubuntu now now uses Upstart. Uh, many Linux distributions, including Ubuntu, will move to System D in the near future, and it's pointless to go over all of them, except you know look them up. BSD in it, Sys5 in it. That's Sys5 as in Sysv in it. Uh, upstart and systemd, and read a little bit about them and how they do things. We will talk about specifically Ubuntu's init process, which is upstart, which will do you absolutely no good outside of Ubuntu. But since we're using Ubuntu, it's one of the downsides that I will probably end up covering it anyway. And then, of course, death. The end of a process's life. Um, a process will generally have a system call exit, and it'll exit with some value. And it'll basically, that's it telling the kernel, hey, I'm done. And the kernel will kill the process and notify the parent that its child process is dead. This sounds really sad. It's a lot less sad because these are inert, deterministic processes running on our machines. So there you go. That is a basic overview of everything that's important with processes. You've got the basic life cycle, and you've got um, everything sort of that is useful to know about IDs, parent IDs, um, how things work with virtualization, UID, effective UID, and niceness, etc. We'll go into more detail on some of these things, uh, and in the next video, you're going to learn a little bit about signals, the way the processes communicate, which is pretty important to know. See you there.